is seventh grade from Germantown Middle School. Can you guys hear me all right? Yep. Hello? Okay, I'm Mr. Shu. Um, I have about half the students and the teacher who just wanted. Uh, we are very excited to hear from you guys today. So I'm going to turn it over to you right away and let you get started. Thank you. Good morning. Hello. Good morning. My name is Laura. I'm Jake. And we are clinical pharmacists. And we've been invited to talk to you today about our role in taking care of patients with cancer because we hear you're learning about cancer. So we put together a short presentation that we're going to share with you right now that explains a little bit better what we do. Is that okay? All right, we've got your screen share. Okay, we're going to try and make it bigger and we'll see if that works. Did that work? Yes. We still okay. see the, we just still see the slide selections on the side, but okay. it's okay. Okay. We'll go with that. All right. Take it away, Jake. All right. So, we work in Gilbert, Arizona, where it was 100 degrees last Friday, and we are uh, kind of a combination. We have a hospital setting where patients come and stay overnight when they're very sick. We have 176 rooms dedicated to that. And of those 176, we have 35 dedicated specifically to cancer patients, typically with a lot of overflow uh, when we fill those 35 beds up. And on the other side of our parking lot, we have a cancer center where that is predominantly where the patients will go and see the physicians, see their nurses, see their pharmacists, and possibly get their infusion as well. But there, they kind of sit more in a recliner uh, until the chemo is done, the chemotherapy is finished, uh, infusing, and then they'll go home. and They won't stay the night over in the cancer center. Uh, we've been open for a, a little over four years, and we have 14 specialty clinics uh, vary in various types of different cancers. So you're probably wondering what pharmacists do. Uh, you, you've probably only seen pharmacists working at Walgreens that are standing behind a counter and counting pills, but they're actually performing a really uh, important job. And so what they actually are doing are making sure that patients receive the right medication at the right dose. So that means when we get a medication order or a prescription, we want to make sure that the order is for a medication that the that the diagnosis actually fits. So for example, if I got a prescription for an antibiotic, but my patient has heart disease, I would want to make sure that the doctor knew that um, I understood they may need an antibiotic, but I want to make sure it's for the right patient. Um, also, we want to make sure that the dose is right, because that makes a big difference. Older patients may need a little bit less than younger patients. We also look at the medication list to make sure that there are no drug-drug interactions. And we're also always checking for allergies, since there are certain medications, if you respond to them once, you may respond to a chemical that's very similar. And most importantly, we're always educating patients about the use of their medications, and that's actually required by law. So when you go to pick up a prescription at Walgreens or CVS, the pharmacist must tell you what the medication is for, how to take it, and any side effects that you may experience. Sometimes we're also asked to teach the public about illness prevention, and so we may go to places like skilled nursing facilities or nursing homes. And finally, some pharmacists are actually registered to give vaccinations, things like the flu shot or the pneumonia shot. So oncology pharmacists. So in particular, as that title illustrates, we are pharmacists, but we specialize in oncology. And that is, as you already know, patients with cancer. Uh, it's a rapidly developing field. There are constantly new drugs being invented and in, uh, every, every month it seems like we've always have new medications coming out. And so what we get to do as pharmacists is we get to study up on those medications, the old ones, the new ones, uh, the ones that will hopefully be coming out sometime soon. And we have the physicians make plans on how to treat. So the patient will come and see the physician. Uh, the physician will run blood work, 
They may take some x-rays, some CT scans, look at what's going on inside their body, as well as look at some of the biopsies. Maybe they see a tumor in a patient, they'll actually go in there and take a piece of that tumor out, send it to the lab. The lab will then break it down into a very basic components of cells. And depending on which components are found, that particular type of cell, that directs how we're going to actually treat that specific type of cancer. Once we have all that information together, then with the physician, the pharmacist will help make a plan for how we're going to treat that. We'll discuss specific medications, some of their side effects. We'll look at the actual patient and determine how old they are. Uh, we'll also determine how uh, healthy their heart is, their kidneys, their liver. And once we have all that information in place, and we take all of our possible treatments, drugs, and different types of therapy, and then we come up with a plan. Um, in addition to that, once we start treating, as we'll talk about this shortly, a lot of the medications that we do use actually cause a lot of bad side effects too. And so once we start the actual medication plan and start giving it to the patients, then we're also going to help the physicians and the patients control some of the side effects that we've created with the drugs we're actually using to treat the cancer. So as we said, Jake and I work in a hospital, but oncology pharmacists can work in various settings. Um, we told you that we have a cancer center right next door to us, so we have many pharmacists that work there. Uh, and oncology or cancer pharmacists can also work in the pharmaceutical industry and drug development. Uh, they can work at research institutions. You may find us in compounding pharmacies. And, and frequently, we may also work in physician offices. Okay, so as you guys have been studying cancer, uh, you obviously know that cancer is more than just one specific type of disease. Depending on where that cancer cell starts, that determines actually what type of cancer you have and how likely you are to survive it, how likely you are to cure it, how likely you are to live a uh, life free of symptoms from cancer. <clears throat> so something you may be interested in is what types of cancer do teens get. Um, there are specific types of cancer that are more prominent in the teenage years. Uh, and then we have a list of those up here, osteosarcoma, leukemia, tumors in the brain, uh, tumors in your bones, lymphomas in your blood, rhabdosarcoma, testicular cancer. Those are the types of cancers we typically see uh, in young adults. So how would you know if you had any one of those cancers? Well, here are a list of potential sim symptoms, and the, now these symptoms are pretty vague, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you have cancer if you have any of these symptoms. But patients who do have these cancers often report that these were the first symptoms that gave them an idea that there may be something wrong with them. So if you would experience these symptoms and they were persistent or bothersome, this is something that you should definitely talk to your parents about so that you can be seen by a physician. Um, Leg or arm swelling that is accompanied by a lump is frequent in our bone cancers. Patients with leukemia often have ex excessive bruising or bleeding. They also may feel unusually tired. Patients with brain cancers can have really severe debilitating headaches. Patients with lymphoma complain of swollen lymph nodes. And patients with rhabdomyosarcoma will complain of persistent muscle pain. Sorry, I was listening to, uh, they were calling a code in the hospital, but it's not on our floor, so. Um, so some of the, the positive statistics about teen cancer is that it's very rare. Uh, less than 1% of all cancers in the United States uh, occur in teenagers. Uh, in addition to that, uh, if the teens or you, uh, your peers get cancer, the odds of you surviving it are very high. And on top of that, the odds of you uh, enduring the chemotherapy even better. Um, one of the good news about young adults is that they've actually spearheaded uh, a lot of the studies. A lot of the studies we've been used on adults came thanks to the children who have enrolled in trials so we can experiment new types of treatment. Uh, a lot of the treatments that we do have in our older population we can directly attribute to the younger generation being willing to involve themselves in trials and actually been able to learn a lot about which cancers or which treatments are more effective and which cancers. So now let's look at how we treat cancer. 
So chemotherapy is a medication that's specifically used to treat cancer. So on the left, you see a medication that's been prepared and then is going to go into a patient's veins. So frequently we'll put in a catheter or a line or tube that goes into the patient's veins and then the medication is pumped into them that way. The patient may either be admitted to the hospital or may go to our clinic infusion center to get the medication infused there. On the lower right hand side, you see fluorouracil, which is a treatment for skin cancer. So this medication will actually be applied to the area of cancer. Uh, it's obviously quite convenient for the patient just to have that applied topically. Above that is a, a medication that is given orally, Gleevec. And this is given for a certain type of leukemia. And fortunately, a lot of the new medications that are coming out are coming out in pill or tablet form. And that's very convenient for the patient because they're able to use this at home. So in the hospital, we often use intravenous medication. So that's when somebody's sick and you see they have a large pole, they've got a bag full of fluid, and that's connected to a line that's directly inserted into the vein in their arm. Uh, these medications have to be prepared by the pharmacy in a very specific and safe environment for a couple of reasons. One, we don't want to be injecting anything directly into somebody's vein or arm that could possibly be dirty. We don't want to give them any new infections. And so for that, you see uh, a young woman here who's preparing intravenous or IV medications uh, that will be injected into a patient. So we keep it a very clean environment. She sees, you see she's in a hood. There's a specific flow of the air to prevent any bacteria or dust from settling anywhere inside that hood to keep it as clean as possible. But on top of that, you'll also notice that she's wearing protective equipment. A lot of the chemotherapy that we give isn't specific to just the tumor cell itself. Unfortunately, a lot of the cancer treatments that we have uh, not only kill the cancer cells, but they also kill human cells as well. Uh, the idea and the hope is that we kill more tumor cells than we kill people cells. But in order to protect our, our employees who work with the chemotherapy, we require that they go through some very specific training and in addition use specific types of barriers to protect themselves while they're making this medication. As you'll see, she's wearing, you can't see it, but she's wearing two sets of gloves. She actually has two jackets on, uh, in addition to that, the hairnet, that's more to keep things clean. And then she also has a mask on. In addition, you'll see there's a large sliding wall of glass in between her and the actual environment where she's working with her hands. All of that's intended to prevent any mistakes or any chemotherapy actually getting on the employees who are preparing the uh, medications for patients. So probably our most important job is to teach patients about their chemotherapy. And every patient who comes to our hospital or cancer center will receive education from an oncology pharmacist. This is because when patients first hear that they have a cancer diagnosis, they're often quite afraid and concerned about what's gonna to happen to them. Explaining to them about the chemotherapy and what to expect, expect really alleviates a lot of that fear and gives them resources to use in terms of us as pharmacists because they're seen quite frequently in the hospital clinic setting. And that's because these treatment plans that we come up with are often given in a complicated series and may take several months or even years to complete. So for example, the most common type of childhood leukemia, which is called ALL, actually takes about four and a half years to complete. So you can imagine there's quite a bit of interaction between the pharmacist and the patient and their family explaining four and a half years worth of treatment. Typically, that can include as many as 30 different medications that they'll receive. And so every single interaction that we have with that patient or family, we're able to further explain what to expect and help them with any expected side effects that they're experiencing to make it a little bit more tolerable for them. So like I already talked about a little bit, the chemotherapy that we use, unfortunately, is very effective at killing cancer cells, but it's also very effective at killing our own cells. And as a result of that, once you start chemotherapy, you're typically going to experience a lot of bad side effects. Uh, as you can see in the picture, one of the most common ones that you'll hear of is nausea and vomiting. Uh, in addition to that, there are other things that will happen within your blood that will make you more prone to infections. Uh, we may injure your kidneys. 
You may get mouth sores that are extremely uncomfortable and actually will prohibit some patients from being able to swallow for a time. Uh, bad diarrhea. Those are the more common side effects we may see from chemotherapy. So one of the jobs, again, as the pharmacist is to make sure that we're drawing the appropriate lab work. We're drawing blood, sending it to lab, so we can monitor how healthy the kidneys are. We can monitor how capable the patient will be to tolerate the chemotherapy we're giving them. Maybe we need to reduce doses uh, in order to allow the patient to tolerate the toxic chemicals we're actually putting inside of them. The good news is that the future holds a lot of promising medications that are more specific and attack the cancer cells themselves with minimal uh, attack onto the actual people cells. So I wouldn't be surprised if in the next 20 years, 30 years, uh, when a lot of you are out of school, maybe some of you are even practicing medicine, you may look back and think about this presentation and think about the medications we're using now, and hopefully you'll laugh to yourselves and say, I can't believe we use such terrible medications to treat this cancer. I really think the future is uh, a positive for the medications that we're inventing and coming up with, but there's still a lot of work to be done. So often we're asked why patients lose their hair while they're receiving chemotherapy. And it can be explained by the fact that cancer cells are some of the most fastest growing cells in the body. And basically the chemotherapy is designed to kill those fast growing cells. Um, hair follicle cells are also very fast growing cells. And unfortunately, since the chemotherapy is designed to kill the fastest cells, those hair cells are affected. Um, not everybody will lose their cell hair during chemotherapy. Um, it is also dependent upon genetics and also the type of treatment that they're going through. But it, thankfully, it's not a permanent situation. Usually within about three months after treatment stops, patients' hair will start to grow back. And it's not uncommon for them to report that the hair that is coming back is thicker and a little bit more curly than their original hair. So I'll talk about where we've come up with some of these chemotherapies, these medications that we actually use, how are they invented? Well, one of the first and most obvious places we find it is in nature itself. Trees, plants, flowers. The paclitaxel is a medication that we use very commonly still today. And that was actually found in Washington uh, by investigators. I don't know how they discovered this or how they connected these dots, but ultimately what they discovered is that the yew tree contained a chemical uh, paclitaxel is what we call it now, it was very effective in treating breast and ovarian cancers. Uh, on top of that, vinca alkaloids, another medication we use very frequently in many different types of cancers, comes from the Madagascar pink periwinkle. Other chemotherapy actually started as chemical compounds. Mustard gas, which was a chemical used in World War II, led to the discovery of a drug class known as nitrogen mustard. So what actually happened was that they found World War II veterans had much lower levels of white blood cells. They made the, they made the distinction that, that it was caused by exposure to the mustard gas. What they did is they reformulated it to make it a little less toxic and made it into now a chemotherapy medication. And some of it just happens by total accident or coincidence. Uh, in this particular study, they were studying a metal uh, known as platinum, and they were actually looking at the electromagnetic effects that it had on bacterial growth, uh, as well as other things. And while it didn't necessarily pan out in the original theory of bacterial growth and the platinums uh, wasn't effective, what they did find, um, by luck, is that it's very effective in controlling cancer. And so that's... Uh, another way in which you actually have our chemical compounds today. And finally, some chemotherapy is to, to designed to look like DNA bases. So you probably learned that cancer is caused by an error in DNA. And in our DNA double helix, we have bases that bind to each other. The cysteine with guanine and thionine with adenine. And what we've discovered is that if we design medication that will insert itself into the DNA and pretend to be one of those bases, that the DNA will actually break, the strand will break, and it will prevent the cell from be, being able to replicate itself. And so here you see a medication that was designed to look like guanine. You can see on the right-hand side, the sulfa or the S 
replaces the oxygen or the O. And what that does is it prevents guanine from binding to cytosine. And so unfortunately, that means that the cell has to die, but it's a great way to kill cancer cells. Some interesting facts about cancer. So as you'll see there, chemo, cancer or chemotherapy, we typically don't give just one drug by itself. We found that if we use different drugs, uh, for example, maybe we use the, the drug that was found in the periwinkle flower, and then we combine it with the drug that was used or found, um, let's just say from that particular metal that we discussed. Um, those two drugs are working in very different manners to kill the, chemo, or to kill the cancer cells. <clears throat> And what we find is the more drugs that we can squeeze in there and the patient can tolerate, the more likely we are to get rid of that cancer in them. Uh, in addition, you may ask yourselves, well, why are there so many different types of cancer? Well, it's because we have so many different types of cells in our body. Uh, each different cell in our body uh, can present itself to turning into a cancer cell. As you already know, uh, the, the trademark of a cancer cell is some sort of genetic mutation within the cell, but then inhibits the cell from actually limiting its own growth. It continues to grow and it doesn't die. Uh, as a result of that, <clears throat> wherever, whatever cell that originates in, that's the type of cancer you have. And here on the slide, it says we have over 100 different types of cells in our bodies. <clears throat> and actually, it's closer to 210. We Googled it, so it's gotta be true. Just don't ever cite that in your studies or your papers to your teachers. <clears throat> So another interesting thing that we found is that acupuncture, which is an old Chinese therapy, can actually help patients. And you may think, if you see on the bottom left-hand side, hopefully that's a little bit clear, but what this therapist is doing, they're actually inserting tiny little needles into the patient's skin. And that may sound painful, but it actually has been found to help patients relieve pain and also relieve things like nausea. And also in Germany, physicians frequently use heat or hypothermia along with chemotherapy to treat cancer. So on the right hand side, you can see a woman, she's likely already received her chemotherapy and on top of her is a device that's applying heat directly to the area where she has the cancer. And we found that cancer cells really don't like heat. So the higher the temperature, the more cell kill that we get. So Basically, um, temperatures can reach as about as high as about 111 degrees from that device. So now research. So a lot of you know there are new drugs that are coming out. Many times we know about a new drug long before it's actually available to be used in patients uh, throughout the nation. Why is that? Well, the reason is, is there's a very specific process that we have to use uh, as healthcare professionals to make sure that the medications they use are not only effective, but they're also safe for the people who use them. And, uh, the FDA, the Food Drug Administration, the national government, they oversee all that research and they oversee when it's appropriate to release medications to the public. Uh, the pharmacist's role in that is actually assisting with all the research that goes into the many years before the drug is released to the public. One of the first things we'll actually do with the medication is when we think we have something that can be of use, um, we'll try it out in various laboratory settings. Once we feel like this is something we want to explore further, we'll actually experiment it on with animals to see how safe it is. Once we feel like we understand the kind of dose that would be appropriate for a person, we take healthy young adults, uh, typically in their 20s, typically men, and we'll test it on them. We'll have them come into a lab, we'll, have the, we'll give them one dose, and we'll keep drawing blood and take levels of that medication until it's totally cleared from their body. We'll watch them to see if there's any side effects. Once that's been done, then we'll actually start testing on people who have the disease we're trying to cure. We'll do it in a very small population at first, and if that's successful, then we'll release it nationwide in various testing centers. We happen to work at one of those testing centers, and the paperwork for that is very tedious. Uh, every patient who comes in, we have to be very specific about everything that happened to them, how the medication worked, what side effects they had, uh, day by day, did they miss any doses, and once we've collected all that data, we return it back in to the company who's making the drug, and then they'll turn all that into the FDA, and then the FDA will determine whether or not we can release that medication uh, to the public for a new, uh, new treatment. So several exciting areas of research that we have going on at our cancer center. 
um, include the use of vaccines to cure cancer. And this is unusual because usually vaccines were developed to prevent diseases, and now we're actually using them to cure diseases. Another area that we're looking at is engineering patients' immune system to recognize and attack cancer cells. So what we found is that cancer cells are very stealth. They're smart. And what they do is they release a protein on their, their surface that actually makes them invisible to our own immune cells. And so they just kind of go and float around, and unfortunately our own immune cells don't recognize them and don't attack and try to kill them. So what we've done is we've taken those immune cells from patients, and we've engineered them to be able to recognize that protein, and in turn, what happens is the patient's own immune system then fixes itself um, and attacks the cancer cells, and basically the body is healing itself. Sometimes the medications we use are not enough to rid cancer from our patients. And here at this particular facility, many others throughout the nation, uh, we do what's called a bone marrow transplant. Uh, in a very brief overview of what a bone marrow transplant looks like is we have a patient who has cancer. Um, perhaps we will put them through a procedure where we actually remove a large amount of their own bone marrow cells. And the bone marrow, as you probably already know from your science class, that's where all of your blood cells are made. Um, they start out as a very simple basic cell that can turn into a wide variety of different cells. And so what we do is we take those cells at a very young age, uh, we remove them from our patient, and then we'll give them a large amount of chemotherapy, wipe out all the existing bone marrow cells that they currently have, and then we'll infuse the cells back into them after hope, hoping that the chemotherapy has significantly reduced the amount of cancer that's in that patient's body and then we rescue them with their own bone marrow cells so they can have blood cells again. Um, that's one way to do it. Another way that we do it sometimes is we eradicate all the bone marrow cells in one particular patient, and we infuse the bone marrow cells of another person into them, typically a sibling uh, or a parent or a child, because as you know, all of us have very specific cells to our bodies, and if those cells aren't closely matched to what the cells were previously in your body, your body will reject it. So as Jake mentioned before, we're now developing some chemotherapy that work at specific targets. Um, so in 2003, a very exciting thing happened. And I know you're probably thinking, that's the year that you are born. That was very exciting, but something else happened. And that was that researchers finished mapping out every gene in the human body. And that was part of the Human Genome Project. It actually took about 13 years to complete in about a billion dollars. But what it did is it gave us all the genes in the human body to then map out and determine if we can use that to our advantage to try and treat diseases. So on these cancer cells, we found that they express certain proteins or receptors. And what we're doing is we're developing medications that will bind to these receptors. And in turn, the cell will then basically kill itself or undergo apoptosis, which is a kind of a suicide. The cell has recognized that it should no longer be alive, and so basically it just kind of bursts. And that's one of the more specific ways that we can treat cancer. The good thing is that these receptors are only present on cancer cells, so that means that the medication only works on these cancer cells, and so the other cells in the body are not affected, meaning there's much less side effects. So other very exciting new areas of discovery, uh, looking into medications that traditionally aren't medications that you may receive in a hospital. Uh, this is called integrative medication. A lot of this is herbal or dietary supplements. Unfortunately, a lot of this has not been well studied, but there is some promising hope that as we do get some studies on some of these medications, it'll be a very non-toxic way to possibly treat chemotherapy in some circumstances, but more importantly, to help alleviate a lot of the side effects that come from chemotherapy uh, or cancer itself. And one of the very exciting things, I think, is uh, we're learning more about the potential of the mind and that a healthy mind, meaning a happy mind, meaning a positive attitude, a uh, good environment, can actually help assist with the uh, 
progression of ridding your body of diseases. Now, again, a lot of this hasn't been studied. We obviously can't incorporate it into a lot of our medications, but I do think that it's some exciting new areas of research uh, that hopefully will help us better understand how the body works and how the body can heal itself. So now let's switch gears and talk about prevention. I know you all need posters that discuss how to prevent the certain diseases that you need posters for those particular cancers. And so these probably are going to be a review for you, but it's always important to discuss these things because obviously prevention is the best way. So number one, don't smoke. That may seem pretty obvious, but um, smoking is a disgusting, dirty habit. And not only that, it causes cancer. So if we could actually convince people not to smoke, we could reduce the amount of cancer death every year by about 30%. And smoking doesn't just cause lung cancer, it causes other types of cancers as well. And you can see a list here. So obviously, when you smoke, all those toxins are absorbed into your body and not just uh, affect your lung tissue, but the, uh, the tissues in the other parts of the body. There's good hey, news, though. For just one second. Sure. Sorry, I hate to do this, but we only have about three minutes left, so I just wanted to give you a little warning. Okay. Sorry. Um, should we just go to questions, you think? Sure. Let's okay. do that. We can't hear. The question can you, was, can you yeah, stand up when you guys ask a question too and then speak really clearly. Yeah, stand up and yell out. Yeah, you have a voice, Mason. <laughs> Do you get paid for testing out new drugs? Patients do get paid, yes. They get paid quite well, actually. <laughs> Find a future job, maybe? Lab rats. <laughs> Unfortunately, there are age limits, so, uh, and I don't think you meet that yet. But in the future, yes, they do get paid quite well. Other questions? Stand up. Yep. Do you enjoy what you do? Well. You, do you enjoy what you do? Is that the question? Yeah. Yeah, uh, it's very rewarding. We see many patients come in with their families in a very uh, uh, terrible moment in their lives, and many times we're often able to provide hope, and we're able to help guide them through uh, these very life-altering diseases. It's very rewarding to, to work with these families. I agree. It's, it's great helping people. And obviously we're in this field because we like people and we want to help them. Well, thank you very much for the presentation. Sorry to um, have to cut it short a little bit there at the end, but thank you for uh, sharing your information with us today. I think we learned a lot. Uh, what do we say, guys? Thank you. thank you. Thanks for having us. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>